It is a blessing to be with you here today on Father's Day, and as we just sang, uh, we have a good, good father, don't we? And it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to keep that in mind, um, knowing that we all come from different backgrounds, and, and we may come from households where we had wonderful fathers and, and godly men who influenced our lives. We may come from situations where fathers were absent and non-existent. We may come from backgrounds where there were abusive fathers, but ultimately we can look that we have a good, good father and a good heavenly father that we can look to. And what an amazing blessing that that is uh, that we have. If you could uh, start with me and turn to Genesis chapter 2, that's where we're going to start today. And you guys are going to help me a little bit with our, our lesson today. I'm a teacher, and uh, I always like to have a little bit of uh, classroom participation. So you guys are my class today. So you guys are going to have to participate. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to ask you this. Um, if you're familiar with Genesis chapter 2, what happens in Genesis chapter 2? Okay, you can shout out. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> what happens in Genesis chapter 2? Okay, good. The creation of man and woman. Okay. I want you to look at the end, the last few verses of Genesis chapter 2. After God has created man and woman, what does he do? Okay. He institutes the first marriage, right? Man and woman. He creates man, creates woman, and then institutes the first marriage. Now quickly back up to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2 is kind of a detail of the sixth day and some of the specific things that go on that were not given in Genesis chapter 1, but in Genesis chapter 1 is an overview of creation. And at the end of creation, in verses 27 and 28, God gives what's called the creation mandate. Um, and in that creation mandate, there are two commands that he gives his new creation. He gives to man and woman. The first of those commands you are probably familiar with, and that is he gives a command to be fruitful and multiply. And what I want you guys to see as we start today that God's design from the very beginning was that families were intended, that a man and woman would become husband and wife, and implicit in that was that they would have children, that God built that in in his good design. And if you'll notice, in Genesis chapter 1, at the very end, he proclaims his creation, and that includes man and woman and his intention that they would ultimately become a family and have children, that there would be a father and a mother in that, he proclaimed his creation what? Very good. It was perfect. This was God's good intention all along. God designed fatherhood. God desires fatherhood. God himself is our good father. He refers to himself as father. Fatherhood was created by God. Unfortunately, we don't have to move too far in the Bible, and we get to Genesis chapter 3, and what happens? Shout it out. Come on. You've got to do better than that. The fall, right. Sin enters this world and corrupts all kinds of things, including relationships, including fatherhood. And so we look around our world today, and we see problems with fatherhood. We see absent fathers. We see neglectful fathers, we see abusive fathers because of sin, because sin has entered this world. But thanks be to God, God as a father sent his son to redeem mankind, to defeat sin, so that we don't have to be a flawed father. And so we're going to take a look today at what God desires of us as fathers. But before we do that, I think it's interesting to take a look at and see what society says. And one of the things as I was preparing for this lesson, I was looking at some articles um, written. And one of the ones that I came across that I thought was, was interesting in terms of what or how society views fatherhood today uh, was a 2010 article in The Atlantic 
um, written by a feminist woman. And the title of the article was very telling, and it, it said this, Are Fathers Necessary? And you can imagine what the article went on to say. But basically, in summary, this article went on to say that single mothers and even lesbian couples are just as good as, if not better, than fathers. And fathers, and the concept of fatherhood is an antiquated concept, a relic of times past, and is no longer needed. And to a large degree, that's how society has come to view fathers. And if fathers are in the household, they're pretty much considered what we see in the media as buffoonish, as ignorant, as selfish, or inept. That's what we see in the media, and we can probably pop to our heads a whole bunch of different TV shows, movies, where fathers are portrayed that way. It is very rare that you see a father portrayed in any kind of positive way at all in the media. And that's what we have displayed in our culture. And that is a lie from Satan. He wants to deceive our culture, our society, in tearing apart the very fabric that God created from the beginning of creation. What God said is good. What God said is very good. And Satan wants to tear that apart. And he has spent many, many years selling a lie that fathers are not necessary. I have an author and a speaker that I enjoy reading named John Stone Street. He's kind of heads up the Colson Center, if you're familiar with Chuck Colson and his work. Um, John Stone Street is now one of the, the main leaders of that. And uh, he's written a number of books and does a lot of speaking. And he has a saying. He says, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. And I want you to think about that for a minute because I'm going to read some statistics. And this idea that fathers are no longer necessary, that's promoted and taught and portrayed, that at best fathers should be sidelined because obviously mother knows best. It's no longer father knows best. It's mother knows best. And dads are not needed. Well, I want to read some statistics. And this is from the 2020 Census Bureau. And it says, children without fathers are four times greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to become pregnant as teens, more likely to have behavior problems. Matter of fact, 85% of behavior problems come from fatherless homes. They are more likely to face abuse and neglect. They're two times greater risk of infant mortality. They are more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. They are more likely to go to prison. Matter of fact, 85% of youth currently today in prison do not have a father figure in their life. They are two times more likely to deal with childhood obesity. They are two times more likely to drop out of school. They are more likely to commit crime. And 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. And we'll stop right there. There are more statistics that we could look into, but I think that's enough and you get the idea. Bad ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have victims. And children are the victims of these evil ideas of our culture that fathers are not necessary. When we go against God's good and perfect design, when we decide that we know best, and men, we're going to have to own up to this to some extent. We've allowed this to happen. We cannot just point the fingers at Hollywood and blame Hollywood and uh, see how they're portraying us. We have to own up to we've allowed some of this ourselves. And I'll use a, a real simple example. Let's say your child comes to you and asks for a bowl of ice cream. Often the common response is, go ask your mother. Yeah, we relegate that leadership that God has given us because we don't want to be busy or burdened with leading our family. 
we joke sometimes about who wears the pants in the family and those kind of things. We men have stepped aside at times and not taken on the God-given role that he has given us. If you could turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. And this is where we're going to start today. And this is where we get the title of our sermon today, Stand in the Gap. And as you guys are turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. In chapter 22, um, God is making an indictment on Israel. Ezekiel is the prophet to the Israelites who have been taken in the second wave into captivity. Jerusalem has not been destroyed yet. The temple has not been destroyed, but it, it soon will be. God's judgment is coming upon Israel for their faithlessness to him. And Ezekiel and several thousand other captives have been taken to the area of Babylon, and they are thinking that they're going to get to go back. And God sends Ezekiel to them to tell them, no, you're not going back. And this is what's going to happen to Jerusalem. And he begins to lay out an indictment upon the land. And he starts with the priests. Here's what the priests are doing and not doing. Here's what your prophets are doing and not doing. Here's what the people of the land are doing and not doing. And he lays out, just like a courtroom, all of the charges that God has against them. And he ends with this statement. And he says, I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it. But I found, what? No one. And so here we have God, and he's not looking, he's not talking about, well, I couldn't find any brick builders, I couldn't find any people who know masonry to fix the wall. That is not what he's talking about here. At this point in time, Jerusalem actually hasn't been destroyed yet. What God is talking about is metaphorically here, Spiritually, he is looking for someone to stand in that breach in Jerusalem's spiritual walls and this evil and this wickedness that has poured into the land that they are participating in willingly. And he is looking for a man or several men to stand in that gap, to hold the line, to proclaim the truth. And God says, I looked throughout the land and I found what? No one. What a sad indictment on Israel. And the reality is we can look around and we can see that's happening in our culture today. We can bemoan the fact of where culture is going and what's happening. And in the last five years, all the things that have gone on and how quickly our society has fallen into decay. But the reality is Fewer and fewer men are willing to stand in the gap in our society and stand for what is right and stand for what is true and particularly to lead their families as godly fathers. And so that's going to be our challenge today that no matter who you are, whether you are a father, whether you're a grandfather, whether you're a young man hoping someday to be married as you start to notice those cute women. My oldest son is, is that age now. He went to college and started to realize, oh, girls are actually cute now. So no matter what point in time your life you're at, you have an opportunity to be a father, to mentor, to teach. Men in here, there are children who come from fatherless homes in our congregation. Be the father in their life. Look to mentor them. Use this today as a challenge. And so what God would desire of us, what kind of men will be men who will stand in the gap? Well, today we're going to look at three characteristics of godly fathers, men who would be willing in the midst of the tide of the oncoming enemy to be willing to stand in that gap, to stand for what is true. And I made it easy for you. They all start with L. The first one is that godly men, godly fathers are leaders, are leaders. And we're going to look at four ways in which men should be leading. Godly men should be leading. So how can a godly man lead? 
the first way. A godly father leads by being the point man for his family. If you're not familiar with the term point man, it's a military term. And the point man is the guy who leads the rest of the squad. And he's out in front, and it is his job to pay attention to and watch out for anything that might be dangerous, any enemy ambushes, any trip wires, any landmines, anything that might be suspicious. It is his job to pay attention to that, to find those things. He is also the most vulnerable. He is out in front. The rest of the squad is a little ways back. That way, guess who gets shot first? The point man. If there's an enemy sniper, guess who stands on the, steps on the landmine first? It's the point man. And then the rest of the squad knows, oh, there's danger. It is his job to lead, to be out in front where m- the most danger is. And I'm not talking about physical danger here. Because let's be honest, it is very rare that as fathers or as husbands that we will be in a situation where we are going to have to step in front of a bullet to protect our children or our wives or step in front of a speeding car and push our families out of the way. Most of the time, we're not going to be in that situation. We would be willing to, I hope, to do those things, but most of the time, that's not the situation we're going to be in. What I'm talking about here is spiritually being the point man. The Bible tells us that Satan is like a lion, prowling, seeking someone to what? Devour. And it is your job as a father to be that point man, to watch out for those dangers, those traps, those philosophies that Satan is laying down to trip up your children to guard against those things. And it requires constant vigilance. It requires unrelenting attention. I read some articles talking about point men in the military, and it talked about how their senses were owned to such a degree that they could detect as someone would step on sand, the different types of sand and how it would crunch. They could detect changes in the wind. They even had a sixth sense as to just tension in the air when something wasn't right. These guys are so incredibly well-trained, they can detect those things. And we as fathers need to be training ourselves so that we are on guard for dangers that might come our children's way, particularly spiritual dangers. And we'll talk a little bit more how we can do that in a second. The second way that a father leads is by being a mentor and a model for his family. Your children will look up to you whether you want to or not. God designed what we often call in the church discipleship. And we look at the model of the church, the early church, and this idea that older men are to teach younger men. Older women are to teach younger women. Well, you know what God designed? He designed something called a family. And in a family, you have an older man and an older woman. Guys, don't ever call your woman, your your wife, old. And when they get together, they have younger men and younger women. (gasps) What do you know? Built into the family. There's that perfect model for discipleship. That is where discipleship begins, is within the family. Fathers, your first opportunity to disciple and your best opportunity to disciple, your first converts to win are guess where? In your family. That's your first job and your main priority. So what kind of things should I be modeling to my children? If you could go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. 1 Timothy 6, 11. And this is a passage I memorized with my boys uh, a number of years ago as I was 
had my first child, and my first child, Kevin, I was kind of wondering, well, how do I teach him to be a man? I, I, I don't know, you know, what does it mean to be a man is kind of the question I was asking myself, and how do I teach him that? Because our society really doesn't have a clear answer to that. If you look around, you know, what makes, at what point does a young boy become a man? We really don't have any clarity on that in our culture. Is it 18 when they're legally an adult? Is it 21 when they can drink? Well, we know it's not an age because we can look at men who are 40 or 50 or 60 years old and they're still little boys. So we know it's not an age. We could throw a lot of other things out there as possible experiences. Is it when you first get your job? Is it what? Who knows? We don't even have in our culture, to a large degree, any kind of ceremony to point out when men become, or boys become men. And so when does it become, and as I was searching the scriptures many, many years ago, I came across this verse, and this is Paul talking to his spiritual son, Timothy, and he says this in verse 11, but you, man of God, run from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. What does God care about? What does God consider to be a man? It is someone who is exemplifying this kind of character. God cares about character, not how much money we have, not how strong someone is, but it's character. So what do I, as a father, need to be a mentor and a model to my children This right here. This character should be flowing from my life. I should be pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And the nice thing is God went on in the Bible to define those, to define what righteousness is, to define what love is. And he sent a model, a perfect model in Christ to exemplify what that looks like. And so as a father, I can then model that to my children and model it in a practical way. I should also, as a father, model being willing to take a stand for the truth and contend for the faith, as Jude, verse 3, says. Jude is encouraging the believers, and he's saying, I wanted to write you to encourage you, but I'm exhorting you to contend for the faith. And as fathers, we need to be the first in line to be willing to contend, to fight for what is true. There is so much that is being thrown at our children today. You do not have to look far to see all kinds of lies and deceptions that are being tossed at them and being tossed at them much faster than we were growing up due to the access to information and social media and all those kinds of things. And I've got news for you. Social media is not going away. If anything, it's only going to get worse. But we need to be able to be the ones who can counter that and teach them from the word of God and teach them how to contend for the faith. That is our job as fathers. We are to be the models of righteousness in their lives. And that means that we model that in all of the practical areas. When I go to work, do I model what a Christ-like work ethic looks like? Do I model that in my speech or do I have a foul mouth? Do I model that in what I entertain myself with? And so on and so forth. Am I modeling those things to my children so they see what a godly man looks like? How else does a godly man lead? A godly father leads by praying for his children. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29. And this is David at the end of his life. And he's about to turn the reign of his kingdom over to his son Solomon. David has also stored up goods for what was his passion, and that was to build a temple. But David was not allowed to build it by the Lord, but David 
was told that his son Solomon would be permitted to build it. So David stored up all the materials and goods that needed to be. And he is offering a prayer here about the temple, but also for his son. And if you look at verse 19, David says this, Give my son Solomon a whole heart to keep and to carry out all your commands, your decrees and your statutes, and to build the temple for which I have made provision. And so you see in David's prayer there for his son is not that his son would have a successful reign or not that his son uh, would be free and have peace from enemies, but rather that his son would be a godly man, that he would keep the commands of the Lord and the decrees of the Lord throughout his life. That was David's prayer for his son, for the spiritual well-being of Solomon. We see Paul pray something similar for his spiritual children, the churches that he founded. You can look at almost every letter that Paul writes, and he talks about praying for those he regards as his spiritual children, these churches that he founded, and this constant prayer that he is continuing to pray for them. We as fathers need to be praying continually for our children. And we need to pray in several ways. One, Obviously, if we see areas where they are struggling, areas where spiritually they have some areas that they need to work on, maybe it's a lack of patience, maybe it's some rudeness to their siblings, we need to be bringing that before the Lord because the reality is this, dads, as much as we may say to them and try to teach them, unless the Holy Spirit is working upon their hearts, our words will make no impact whatsoever. And so we have to be praying constantly that the Holy Spirit would be working upon their hearts. That our words might be effective. That their hearts might be softened. Another thing we should be praying for our children is their spouses. Now, my wife convicted me of this a number of years ago, and it's one of those things. I don't know if this is just being a guy or whether this is just me, but I just kind of completely went over my head. And she came along, oh, I, I'm always praying for, you know, their future spouse. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I never thought of that. And so one of the things we need to do as men, because obviously if we have daughters, those of us in here who have daughters, I've got three of them, you know you want whatever guy comes into their life, you know you're wanting that better be the right guy because you are super protective of those special little girls in your life. And no little punk better be taking out your daughters, right? Well, you ever thought about praying for those young men? That God would be working on their lives now? My little five-year-old, am I praying for her future spouse? Now, so I know some of you dads are praying that there would never be any spouse. <laughs> I've thought about that at times. What about for your sons? Are you praying for that God would bring a special young woman, that he is working on her heart, that she might be a good helpmate and encourage him in the Lord? Are we doing those kind of things, or are we forgetting to be prayer warriors for our children? The last way, and probably I would say the most important way that a father can lead is to teach and guide his children in practical spirituality. If you could turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I will put this one on the board here. I believe Deuteronomy chapter 6 is kind of the central passage for parenting in terms of raising biblical and godly children. I think you have to start here. There's a lot of other passages you can go to in Scripture, but I think this has to be the starting point. And so as we read this together, it says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And I'm going to stop right there for a second. And I want us to key in on that verse 5, because a lot of times when we talk about parenting, we skip to verse 7, and we read that part, and we talk about parenting, and we forget that it's connected to verse 5. 
I can't separate parts of scripture. I need to read the whole thing in context. And this is talking about what I'm to do. I'm to love the Lord God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And as I do that as a father, what is one of the things that I'm going to do? Well, let's keep reading. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. I'm going to highlight a few words here. If you notice, the first two words that I highlighted there are instructions to parents. To repeat and talk. In teaching, we have a saying that repetition is the best teacher. That's why teachers constantly repeat things. That's why things get repeated year after year, to emphasize it, to stick it in those kids' brains. Guess what? As parents, you're to repeat the commands, the principles, the desires of God to your children. You are to talk about them. But you'll also notice God gives us another word in there that's a key word. It's repeated four times. And what is that word? Oh, you got to do better than that. There you go. Okay. Yeah, when? It's a time word. So I'm going to ask you that question in your own words. When are you to repeat and talk about the commands of God? Yeah, all the time. That's the point. Okay, all those things that are listed there, the point is you are to do this all the time. So as a parent, as a father, you are to constantly be talking about the things of the Lord. And that does not mean you break out your Bible and sit down everywhere you walk. You're walking around in the store and you've got your Bible out, okay? You're walking around while you're fixing the car and you've got your Bible. No, that's not what God is talking about here. God is talking about the idea of practical spirituality. When I take them to the store, do I teach them about stewardship? Here's why we're buying this and why we're not buying this, because God wants us to be a wise steward of our money. Guess what? I just taught them a biblical principle. I didn't have to break out my Bible, but I taught them what God's word says. When I teach them and go to discipline them, where do I start? I'm going to start here with God's word and teach them. Why is it I expect you to obey me? Because what does God say? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And I go to God's word. Why is it when I go to work, whether I like my employer or whether I don't like my employer, why is it I'm going to give my best effort because I'm working for the Lord rather than for men? biblical work ethic, and I'm teaching my children that. Practical spirituality. That's my job as a father. That's what we are called as men to do and to exemplify. You know what? You can find this elsewhere in Scripture. And children love the first part of this verse, and they like to stop. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, or some of our translations read, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Uh, I even had one of my children once. I had to uh, discipline him, and I came downstairs, and I found typed on my computer screen as a screensaver, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not exasperate your children. So after the discipline, we had to have another conversation that there's another part to that verse. And as you see, God also tells us, how do you not exasperate your children? How do you not stir up anger? Well, you bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, that's what you're to do. That is your task given to you by God. And that word bring there in the Greek means to nurture to maturity. That's our end goal, is to bring our children to spiritual maturity. A lot of times we talk about them being physically and socially and mentally and emotionally mature, and those are all good goals. Guess what? Your child will not be socially or emotionally mature unless they are spiritually mature. Because when I go to talk about all those social type things like being kind and not rude and loving other people, guess where you find that? Right here. And so when I teach them to be spiritually mature, will all those other things follow along? Absolutely. That's my job as a parent. And my end goal, like I said, is is maturity, and we want to say, as John said of his spiritual children in the church, in 3 John 4, John says, I have no greater joy than this, 
than to see my children walking in the truth. Oh, what a great thing that we could say as fathers as we turn our children loose into the world and we can say, I have no greater joy than this, to see my children walking in the truth. It may have taken a long time to get them there, and sometimes it feels longer than others. There are those days where it's like, oh my gosh, haven't we gone over this 20 times already? But being faithful to instruct along the way. So godly fathers are leaders. And the second thing, godly fathers are learners. What does it mean that godly fathers are learners? Well, godly fathers can only be effective if they themselves are growing spiritually. We just said that godly fathers, one of the things that God tells fathers to do is to teach and to train their children. Guess what? If you're not growing spiritually, you can't teach and train your children. You cannot be effective. There's an old saying in teaching that you can't teach from a dry well. And so teachers have to go through this thing called professional development. And the idea is to constantly be learning new t techniques, new ways of teaching, new things about your subject that you're teaching, and to be learning and growing along with the students so that you can effectively communicate the curriculum to your students. The same thing is true of God's word. We have to be in God's word. We have to be growing spiritually because we can't teach our children. And the reality is if we are not growing spiritually, then sin will begin to permeate and impact our lives as fathers. And we will be immature Christians. And how can I expect to raise mature believers and say, I have no greater joy than this, to see my children are walking in the truth if I'm immature. That's the reality. I can't expect that if I am not continually filling myself and learning and growing in God's word. And you do not have to be a pastor. You do not have to go to a Bible school to do that. They, we live in the information age, for crying out loud. There are so many free resources that you can get to learn and study and grow and basically get all of the information that you might get in a Bible school. It is amazing how much information. For that matter, you can learn and hop online and get free resources to learn Greek words. There are all kinds of resources we have to grow as men in the faith. The third and final characteristic of godly fathers is that godly fathers are lovers. And I'm not using this term in the sense that it's commonly used in culture here, but there are a number of things that the Bible discusses and commands men and us as believers to love. And so we're going to start with the first and foremost one. What should a father love? Well, we can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we read. Command by God that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. All believers are to do that, and guess who's included in that? Fathers. And as fathers, as you the leaders, guess who should be doing this first? We should. And the reality is, this is my priority. This is my number one relationship that I need to take care of. Because if I do not have the vertical relationship taken care of, and I am not loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength, guess what? That, those horizontal relationships, my love for my wife, my love for my children, my love for my friends, all of that will be affected and impacted. I cannot expect to have that agape love towards all those other relationships if I am not right with my Heavenly Father. I have to love him first and foremost before any other relationship. That has to be a priority. And if, well, what does that mean to love God? Well, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 tells us that love for God is this, to obey his commands. Boom, simple. See how easy that was? To obey his commands. That's love for God. 
Are you as a father seeking to do that? Now, does that, that doesn't mean you need to be sinless because guess what? If you think you're going to be sinless, you never will. I don't have to go any further than to ask my children or to ask my wife, and they will very clearly communicate that I'm not sinless. And probably that's true of every father in here. But I need to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength. I can't presume to have a right relationship with anybody else if I don't do that first, and I don't do that well. This is also what we call the greatest commandment. And we know that because God himself, Jesus, came down here and was asked in Matthew 22 by the Pharisees and Sadducees, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And guess what he said? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the greatest commandment. So if God considers this to be the greatest commandment, we'd better consider that as well. How else am I expected to to love? Godly fathers love their wives as Christ loved the church. If you could go with me real quickly to Ephesians chapter 5. As husbands, we sometimes love to go to Ephesians chapter 5, and we like to stop at verse 22, which says, wives, submit to your husbands. And we like to stop right there and nudge our wives a little bit. And the interesting thing is there's only one verse for the wife. But then you go on, and there's like an entire paragraph for husbands. So maybe we should read a little bit farther, husbands. Starting in verse 25, and I'm only going to read a small section of this here, and it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. And so our second priority that God has given us as fathers is to love our wives. First, we love our Heavenly Father, and secondly, we love our wives. But the verse doesn't stop there. It doesn't say just love your wives because, that, let's be honest, that would be easy, right, guys? Go buy her a new outfit, take her out on a date. I'm loving her, right? Uh, but it goes on to say what? You got you to respond. Okay. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Oh, this is where we get into that sacrificial love. And again, sometimes we think, oh, well, this would be easy. Yeah, I'd be willing to lay my life on the line. I'd be willing to die for my wife. Well, how many of you in here have ever had to die for your wives? Okay, there better be no hands because you're all here. None of us have been in that situation, and most of us probably never will. Where it gets difficult is showing love for our wife in a sacrificial manner on a daily basis, on the simple things. When you come home and you're tired and all you really want to do is sit on the couch and just relax, maybe take a nap. And your wife has had a hard day and the kids are running around the house attempting to put holes in places and you really don't want to deal with them. Sacrificial love is willing to come and take some time and say, wife, sweetie, why don't you rest? I'll take the kids for an hour and play with them. Or the thing I dread and hate is the hand wash dishes. I hate those. But being willing to notice that she's tired, she's done a lot of work today, I'll do those tonight. Or better yet, what my children think, this is why we had the children, to have them do it. <laughs> My middle daughter asked, what are you guys going to do when we're not in the house anymore? Who's going to do all the work? <laughs> well, we'll have less dishes, you know. <laughs> but being willing to do those little things, to be willing to sacrifice your time and needs and desires for the betterment of your wife. And why is that so important as a father? Because that needs to be, it goes back to that modeling idea. My sons need to see how a godly man will treat his wife. I have to be the model of that. 
whether it's something simple like opening the doors or whether it's something where I have to lay aside some of my desires and wash the dishes or cook a dinner or take the children somewhere. Okay. Whatever it might be to love on my wife, they need to see what that looks like, that her needs come first, that I am willing to sacrifice of myself. That has to be the priority. My girls need to see what a godly husband looks like so that someday when, God forbid, they actually do find a young man, they are looking for a godly young man who will treat them with respect, with love, with dignity, and with care, and they won't find comfort in the arms of some jerk because they had a jerk for a father. And that's how they were treated, and so they run and find comfort in the arms of anybody. I need to demonstrate godly love to my wife so that my girls see that as well. That's my job. Last one. How else do fathers demonstrate love? Through time. Through time. Spending time with their children. And this may sound like a no done, kind of an odd one up here, but I've come to find that this is one of the best ways. If you want your children to communicate with you and to share with you in their later years and to ask those tough questions and that you be the one that they go to, not their friends, not social media, time is the key. To be willing to set aside maybe what you desire to do to get to know them, to get to do things that they desire to do. And I put up here quality versus quantity because there's a lot of emphasis, if you, if you look at parenting books and things like that, about spending quality time with your children. Well, I've got news for you. Unless you spend quantity time, you will never get quality time. It doesn't happen. You cannot plan quality time. You can try. And my wife and I have planned things at times to spend with the ki children and these wonderful events and they're fun time with the kids, and sometimes that's all it is. Nothing special comes out of it, because you can't plan quality time. But there are other times where we're just doing whatever. We're just hanging out as a family, and all of a sudden, the conversation just happens to go in a direction. We didn't even intend it to go that way, and all of a sudden, it becomes this deep, meaningful half hour, 45 minutes, where we're just engaged and talking, and wow, where did that come from? because you're spending time with your kids and you get chances to share and talk about God's word, what's going on at school, and counsel them from God's word, how to interact with that relationship or that situation. And God's word becomes powerful and effective because you're spending time with your children. And dads, I'm going to just share something with you that I know at least me personally I have to deal with and be careful of as a father Dads, we, as men, have something that women don't have, and that's something called a nothing box. And we tend to go there sometimes. And I found this out a number of years ago with my daughters. I didn't grow up with a sister, so I learned something new when I had daughters. They like to talk, and they like to talk a lot, and they don't stop. And it was very different when I took my boys out for a trip or something like that. My oldest son, he would sit and stare out the window and count cars, and he wouldn't say a word the entire time. And then I would take my girls out, and it was just nonstop. And I would find myself that three minutes would go by, and I would realize I have no idea what they just said because I went to my nothing box. And I have to be careful as a father that I need to make sure that I am paying attention to what they're saying, because in the midst of all that chattering, it's amazing sometimes things come out that I can spend that quality time with them, and they'll be asking things, or they'll be making statements about what's going on in their life, and that's my opportunity to get an interaction with them. And when you do that, and you spend that quality or quantity time with them, then what happens is now my children, in the last couple of years, they've come into our bedroom at night and they'll start talking just about random things and all of a sudden we start having these deep discussions and they're sharing about what's going on in their lives. 
and we get opportunities to do discipleship. Wow. Not because I planned it, but because we were willing to spend that time with them. So what are the three characteristics of godly fathers? Men who will stand in the gap of an evil, wicked culture. They are leaders of their families. They are learners of God's word. And they are lovers of those around them. I'm going to end with this passage here, and this may be a familiar passage. This is Joshua 24, 15, and you can go to Hobby Lobby and get the end part of this verse. So you can mount on your, your door. No, I'm not getting promoted by Hobby Lobby. But this is Joshua as the Israelites have gone in and conquered the land. And he's at the end of his life, and he's challenging the Israelites, and he's throwing down the gauntlet, kind of saying, listen, you need to figure out who you're going to serve. Which God? Are you going to serve Yahweh or are you going to serve these other gods? And this statement at the end, he says, as for me and my family, we will worship Yahweh. Or the more familiar way it's, it may be phrased is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So fathers, are you willing to make that statement for your families today? That is for you and your house, you will serve the Lord, you will be that father who is willing to stand in the gap for your children or maybe for some other young men or women who do not have a father in their household right now. Will you be willing to be that man to emulate Christ in their lives? Will you stand in the gap? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word today that you are a great God and a great Father to us, Lord, that we can worship, that we can know, that we can lean on and trust you. Lord, we just pray that as fathers, as we celebrate fathers today, Lord, that you would convict us, Lord, that you would uh, encourage us, that we would take up the gauntlet, that we would be willing to stand in the gap, that we would lead in the midst of a dark world, in the midst of a sinful sinful world, that we would disciple the next generation. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.